John 17, 18. As thou sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. As I meditated upon this passage and trusting the Lord that what would you have to say to us? It occurred to me that our parents they are only a vehicle that brings us into this world. It is God who sends us into the world. Parenting is just a vehicle that brings people into the world. Having a father, having a mother, is just a means by which we come into this world. But we are a people that are sent into the world. It means everybody you see, particularly believers, there is no mistake about our lives. We did not just find ourselves with our parents and we are in this world. We are actually sent into the world. So that gladdens my heart. Although it also raises some other issues, but at least first, I know that I am not just here randomly. We are not just here purposelessly. Somebody sends us into the world. It has to be settled upon our spirit that we are not just here. Because if we are not conscious of it that we are sent, it's like when you call your son, and you say, take my car and go and get fuel for me. And then that son, he entered the car. The car is nice. It has AC and good music. And he began to enjoy the car. And he began to drive around to go and visit his friends and have a good time and have a wonderful time. The problem is that the purpose for which that car was given to that son has not been fulfilled. He was not given that car to simply <clears throat> enjoy. He was given that car to run an errand. So that is in the same way in which God has given every one of us this human body and we have been sent into the world secondly is that we are sent in the same way and in the same capacity which jesus was also sent into the world he said as thou hast sent me into the world so have i also sent them into the world. We are sent in the same, it's like we are sent to do the same thing <clears throat> that Jesus Christ was sent to accomplish in the world. We are sent in the likeness <clears throat> of Christ. We are sent in the capacity of Christ. Now, part of the issue with that is we cannot run this errand unless we are also in the nature of Christ. There is no way we can be sent in the same way Christ was sent and we will be able to fulfill <clears throat> what Christ did if we do not have the mind of Christ. So it's a big response. Even though it's a, it's a great opportunity, it's a great privilege, 
it's also a big responsibility to be sent in the capacity in the same way that Jesus Christ was sent to the world. It means that we need his mindset. We need his nature. We can only truly function in this world to the extent and to the degree which our lives is conformed to the image of Christ. It is that is the basic requirement that is required for us to run this errand. He said, even so have I also sent them in the same way. If our lives does not align with the nature and character of Christ, <clears throat> we are actually not fulfilling the purpose for which we have been sent into this world. And we need to note that it is to the world that we are sent. It means that our aim in the world is not to just be part of the world, but to have a consciousness that we came from somewhere to this system. The painful thing usually is that the world system, uh, it, it swallows us and conforms us into its image. You see, when you have to pass through a door, and it's only a little space. Rather than walk through the door like this, you try to adjust your body. So you, even if your tummy is big, you try to put it in, and then you move. What you have done is that you have conformed yourself to that passage. You have conformed yourself to that door. So the scripture says that, be ye, it says, be not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. One major issue that bothers almost everybody is that, why am I here? What is the reason? Why am I here? I just discovered that. And one day I sat and asked myself, how come our lives is all about when we are born, we just start going to school. And then once we are done with school, they ask us to get a job. We get a job, they say, you should get married. You get married, and you start having children, you start laboring. You know, my dad is 80, 88 now or so. I remember when he would take us to school in the morning. When he was doing all of those stressful things. Now he can't do all of that again. But I, 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 I reflect back. What exactly was his purpose? Is that all that is to life? Because the system, the worst system, is going to conform you. That, see, life is all about getting a job, getting money, raising children. Before you know it, you start giving children out in marriage. After a while, they start calling you that, oh, we had a child. Then they start calling you grandpa. And then the circle just keep repeating itself. If we are not careful, we will be swallowed up in that system. But we must be conscious that there is somebody who places us here deliberately. It also means that we must find out what exactly did he send us to do. You know, you can do so many things. Paul was in Antioch with Barnabas. The Bible said that they assembled together with the church. They taught the church for one year and the church was called Christian first in Antioch. Now, that's a great work. Then one day as they were having prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit came and said, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work for which I have called them. So what were they doing before? What were all of those activities? You see, in this world, we will be involved in many things. Even God will allow us to be involved with many things. But we must not miss the main thing. 
so many people have spent their lives pursuing the many things, but they miss out on the main thing. There is a, there is a senior colleague at work. He's about 61 years old. And a, he's a pastor, so-called pastor. And many times I will sit there and say, Pastor, sir, you said God called you. You said you were sure about it. You said you were gifted. But you never pursued that call. I said, at 61, you are still in civil service. And you know, you said clearly that this is not the plan of God for your life. I said, why didn't you pursue the plan of God for your life? He said, hey, you know, he has children. He has to raise them. They have to go to school. I said, do you think if God called you, he will not have figured out how he's going to take care of your children? So because of family commitment, chaos of this world, he was so afraid to move into whatever he felt God had called him. And I told him one day, I said, see, I said, God is not going to use a retired man. <laughs> I said, I don't mean God will not use you just because you are working and retired. I said, if God has a call, he comes very early in life to call people so that the active part of their life, they can use it to serve God. I said, you are planning that when you are finished raising all your children and at 65, you will now retire. You will now come out and say, Lord, I'm ready to fulfill your purpose. I, think you, I said, do you think God is a fool, sir? I said, I will cancel you. That if you are truly persuaded that this is what God had called you to do, go and do it. Not mindful of what people will say. He will provide for you. But he's so afraid to go into that. The reason is that he is doing many things. Even some legitimate and good and godly but there is always a main purpose david was anointed to be king and the bible said the spirit of the lord came upon him mightily but the next time we were going to see david he was playing harp and he played it so well that when they needed somebody to play for saul they said they, they know somebody who plays guitar very well. is David. And David was playing that. Now, that was good. That was even an opportunity for David to see how the palace works. But David will have made a great mistake of his life if he thinks that he was just called to be a musician. And he now devote his time to this. In fact, he will be famous. He may make money. People will appreciate it. But the main thing, the main thing, he has missed it. You see, Jesus, he did many things. He healed the sick, opened the eyes of the blind. He even raised the dead. But I discovered that he did not forget his main purpose. When they were going to make him king in John, the Bible says, when he knew that they were going to make him king, he ran to the mountain. You see, logically, you'll be like, you, you are king of kings. You came to set these Jew people free. Now they want to make you king. Why will you run away? Jesus ran away from making him king. You know, somebody prayed for me last week, this week. I'm now, by the grace of God, an assistant director. And he said... Very soon, you will become director. And I said, I reject it in Jesus' name. And he said, ah, everybody, they were shocked. You know, these are the kind of prayer when you pray at work. Hey, people can almost kneel down for you. Say, amen, oh, amen, oh. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. Why are you talking like this? Why? I said, see, I'm not extreme and I am not stupid. Do you think I don't want to be a director? I said, but I know the plan of God for my life. And anything good that may come to replace it, I won't accept it. I said, don't worry. I know God's plan for my life. And I know what is not in the plan of God for my life. When Jesus was going to die, Peter took him aside and rebuked him. That's the first time we are seeing human beings rebuke Jesus. He said, and Peter rebuked him, saying, Master, you will not die. You will live to fulfill your purpose on that. You know, that's a good prayer to say amen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. 
for you are mindful of the things of men, not the things of God. Because despite all the miracles, despite walking on water, the main purpose of Jesus was to die. If he didn't die, we will not have eternal life. Jesus did not need to die to heal people. He didn't need to die to raise the dead. He didn't need to die to raise the eye of the blind. He could do all of that without death. But we cannot receive eternal life without his death. Except a corn falls to the ground and dies, he abides alone. So it was tempting to settle for many good things. There were many good things that Jesus could settle for. He could settle for working on water miracle ministry. He could settle for raising the dead miracle ministry. Even I blind shall see ministry international. He could settle for all of that. And you know, the real purpose is the one that is painful, that is shameful, that is disgraceful. Is the one of all of those options you will actually not want to take. And that's why many people don't also like or don't fulfill the plan of God for their lives. Because the cross that is required, they are not prepared to take that cross. They are not prepared to follow that cross. You know, I just remembered that in the year 2000, there about when I was in my 100 level, and I gave my life to Christ, I became serious with the scriptures, I became serious with God, and uh, I was still doing my academics. Most of my colleagues then that say, oh, we don't have the time for Bible, we, have, we just want to read our books. You know, I look back today, we probably all of us came out with the same class of degree in the end, but I have another class of degree that was already added to me. They, it, what they, we, we were doing in school was good, but we missed out. Many of them missed out on some of the critical things because I realized that there are things you cannot do you can only do effectively when you are young. You know, in those days, it was, there were years I would read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation twice. January to June, I'm done. I will start again Genesis by December, I'm done. <clears throat> I thought it would always be like that. Now, <clears throat> one week, I'm still struggling at times with two chapters. <laughs> <laughs> And he's taking me time. So many commitments here and there. So many disturbances here. So many. But you know God is faithful. Those scriptures are in the heart. There are things one must not mean. So the, the, the point I'm really stressing is that he said he sent us. You see that purpose for which God decided that I'm going to release Pastor Bang Badi. I'm going to release this person. That one among other things is the one that must not be missing. We must not miss that. If we miss that, then we have missed God completely. And that can only be when we conform to the image of Christ. The scripture says, we are his workmanship, like we are his tool, created in Christ Jesus unto every good works, that has been prepared for us before the foundation of the world that we should walk in it. The greatest strategy of men, tragedy of men, is that men do not know their purpose. So we do so many things, but we miss out. He said there is something that has been prepared for us even before God, even before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, he said, before the foundation of the world, that we should walk in them. He had prepared it. That is the purpose of our lives. But the only way we can discover it, we can walk in it, is that we must be created in Christ Jesus. You know, the way I understand it is like, when you take iron ore, raw, and then you now want to make hammer with it. And then you begin to form it. And everything cools off and in the end you have an hammer. 
it is in, in the end that you can say, oh, this is to be driving nails, to be driving things. Why that iron was in a raw state, you cannot know its purpose. The purpose is only revealed when it has been fashioned. If you fashion it into spanner or screwdriver, then you know that, okay, this is what I'm supposed to use this for. Many people spend all their lives in this raw state. They are just iron ore. Iron ore is useless until you are able to make a tool or something or a product out of it. When we see that product, we will now understand what that product is to be used for. That is what, in the sense in which Paul was saying, we are his workmanship created in Christ unto every good works that he has planned for us to walk into. So we must remain in the hand of Jesus to form us, to shape us, until our purpose is revealed. Actually, the purpose of every human being is located in Christ. Outside of Jesus, nobody can fulfill the purpose of God. And that purpose, it is only in Christ that when you now come into him, it, and, and he's, been tra- he's transforming your life, that the whole thing will be becoming apparent. You will say, okay, oh Lord, this is, so this is what you want my life to be. Now, if that doesn't mean we will not do different things. We will do different things. But there is always a main thing. You see, when you look at every man that God created, when you look at the scriptures, though they did many things, there is always one major thing for which they must do. You see, Joseph was to be king to preserve the nation of Israel. That is his main, his main purpose in life. That one day he will be a king that will preserve the life of the children of Israel. But before then, he was a house manager that did exceptionally well and became the head of the best house in town or one of the best house in town. He's in charge of this, he's in charge of that. That in itself is, may, may look so good that you may begin to say to yourself, is it not good to settle in this one? Is it not good for me to just settle in this one? And men we commend you, men we praise you. So it's not those things that men praises you for that really matters. It is what you have discovered in Christ to be your purpose that matters. So we can do many things. And God himself will even allow some of those things. But if we have not done that main thing, then we have not done anything. Now, another issue in this verse is that our life, in the end, is going to be judged, evaluated on account of this purpose for which we are sent. It's not going to be based on the so many things that we are doing here and there. It is going to be on this one. Did you, there is a reason why I put you in this place. You know the, 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 the pain in Nigeria. We say, oh, Christians, when, when Christians get to office, when Christians get there, they don't do this, they don't do that. I have realized that. Many of the people we are calling Christians are not Christians in the sense of the scripture. You see, if you are a Muslim, you are a Muslim. But if you are a Christian, you may not be a Christian. If you are a Muslim, you are a Muslim by default. But you can't be a Christian by default. You can be born into a Christian home, but until you come to accept Jesus and you understand the mind of God, Christians are probably the most blind people I've ever seen in the place of work. We are not conscious, not sensitive, because we do not seek after Christ. We can't even see what is going on in our nose. We don't know how to interpret events. We don't know how to pray. So we just blame and say, yes, this one, he got to position. He didn't get to that position for Christ. Just because he attends church service does not mean that he has gone for that position to represent Jesus. Many times, people go for position for their own personal ambition and personal fulfillment. You now feel that because he belongs to a church, he should, uh, he should serve the purpose of Christ. He doesn't work that way. He's not going to serve the purpose of Christ. 
But we must keep in mind that at the end of our journey, this is what we measure. This will be what will be the measure of our life. You see, God, I imagine that what God is going to do is to, is, there is going to be a scale. That scale will be Jesus. And it's just going to be placing every one of us by side to measure us. Yeah. Is it your turn? Yeah. Stand by your side. How did you measure? Because see, to, the, to the extent to which you measure to Jesus is to that extent you can fulfill the purpose for which Jesus Christ sent you. Another issue in this verse is that the person we are going to give account to ultimately of our life is the person who sends us. It's not what we have done in this system. It's not our family members. It's not our parents. It's not no. It's Jesus, and the Scripture says we all shall stand, not before His seat. He has seats, but there is one that is called judgment seat of Christ. There are different seats. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in uh, in public settings, they have all kind of seats. They have a, a, a sitting. They say this. They even call it sitting. They say this one is plenary. <laughs> one is uh, they have all kind of sitting. So they do different things at different sitting. So it's not just chair. It's, it's not just that they are sitting on a chair. Each sitting has meaning. When he says we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that's that's a different seat entirely. So he, he is the one who can say, uh-huh. so I sent you to do this for me. How did you do it? That is the evaluation. You are not going to be evaluated based on the good words they spoke when you retired. You are not going to be evaluated based on your children's opinion, your grandchildren's opinion of how wonderful a father you are. As good as that is, it is the one who sends you and who knows the grace he made available the mercy he made available, the favor he made available. You know, grace, grace is God's power to accomplish what ordinarily we can't do, humanly speaking. But grace works silently. So the tendency is that you may think it is you. You may, you may be a very good administrator, a very good lecturer, you may be sound in this area. You may be a, a, a good accountant. You may, be, you may just have this corny skill. Brethren, it is given by God. It is the grace of God. And God does not do anything for your selfish purpose. He does not give any gift, skill, talent, training, opportunity for selfish purpose. In fact, when you look at it, why did, when he gave Noah the grace to build an ark, it was to save some people. It was not just for Noah. Even when he called Abraham, when he called Abraham, he said, in you will all the nations be blessed. When Joseph came on board, it was to preserve life. He himself said, he said, God sent me ahead of you to preserve you. He didn't say, you sent, you, you, you sold me into slavery. Africa is still battling with slavery today. We have no idea. You know, slavery is so bad that we feel that there can't be any divine purpose behind it. It's like Holocaust. 6.2 million people killed. But you see, God had warned the children. When you read the book of Jeremiah, he had warned them when they were when he scat, when Babylon came, he warned them, he said, See, return to your land. He said, Don't be afraid again. You have seen, I've dealt with you, but now return to your land and I'll protect you. But if you go to other countries, you know, I read that recently and I was shocked. He said, I will hunt you there, I will kill you with sword, I will kill you with famine, I will kill you with all of these things. And it happened to them. And until they returned to that land, the only place they have a Jew have a have protection really today is in their land. There is a satanic global hatred for the Jewish people because somehow 
their being alive has something to do with the eternal plan of God, which the devil uh, is doing everything to terminate that, if he is able to terminate all the Jewish people. So he said it is when you stay. So if we don't have understanding, we won't even know that there's something behind some of these things that are happening. There's nothing in the world that is happening carelessly. That we have Boko Haram, we have terrorists and so on. One of the things some of this kidnapping, killing, harm, robbing has done is to actually reveal to many Christians that they do not have faith in God. Many believers are living in, in fear. And we are praying for all this problem to go so that we can have peace. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I want you to have peace in the midst of this. He said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the word gives. Can you sleep when you know that there, is, there are kidnappers? Can you sleep in a country where that is filled with armed robbers? Can you still be at peace when all of these things are happening? If we don't have peace, it's not because of those people. It's because we have not placed our faith in Jesus. What we have is environmental peace. That means that for as long as things within our environment, they are peaceful, then we will also pretend to have peace. But the real peace of God, it's amazing that the day they came to they arrested Peter and they were going to behead him. Now they had beheaded James. They were praying for him. And then God now sent um, an angel to set Peter free. Up to today, when I read that scripture, I ask myself, God, I know I'm not like this Peter. How will you help me? The angel met Peter sleeping. Please, which one of us, knowing your head will be cut off tomorrow morning, we sleep? <laughs> now, we want to see the miracle of Peter. How can we? We can't walk in what they walked in because we don't even place our faith in the word of Christ the way they did. How can some people so much rest in God's word that even though you know you will be beheaded tomorrow, if I, it wasn't even a small sleep. Any sleep that requires an angel to wake you up from is a, is a serious sleep. And it was still sluggish. There was no anxiety that, ah, hey, at last, hey, that is victory. Please, where is the gate? Where is the gate? Where are we going? He was still like, he's dreaming. Because, the Bible says he thought he was dreaming. Because as far as he was concerned, he was dead. You know, Jesus told him, that see, one time is coming, they are going to kill you in a way that you don't want. So I'm sure Peter must have concluded that oh, maybe this is it. I, I, I ask myself, God, any little thing agitates my own heart. If I wake up in the morning and I have flat tire, oh, what is all this world this morning now? I, I'm disturbed. I'm, I'm thinking of, oh, look at the time. Hope I won't go late. Hope I won't. But you know, again, I ask myself, how can a man? Like Job, how can you hear news that, sir, all your children just died now? Sir, all your business just failed? Sir, did, even his wife that he cared for, paid his dowry, now said, cause God and die. I'm like, why can't you tell me die? Why must I cause God? Even his wife. And when he heard all of that, the scripture says, he removed everything, he bowed down and worshipped God. I'm like, die. How do these people work with God? That they could do this? How could you lose all your children? You know why many of our women are going for some prayer meetings here and there? I see some of them online. They didn't want their children to die. They are afraid of witnessing death of their children. So the, those prayers are motivated by, by fear, not faith. They are not praying for those children to fulfill God's purpose for their life. Lord, our children will not die. We won't bury our children. We won't bury. There's an easy way out. Train them in the way of the Lord. Pray for them into the purpose of God. God himself will keep them. He said, the tree that bears fruit, my father prunes to produce more fruit. God will have a responsibility to your life if your life is fulfilling his purpose. But he said, why, me, why must I keep a tree that is unfruitful? Why must I keep a tree? You have lived for 50 years, you have not dealt with hunger. Hatred is still there. Malice is still there. Bitterness is still there. Iniquity is still there. For how long will God preserve our lives? 
for how long we Jesus said, How long will I be with you? That means he expected that at that time you people should have been able to handle so many things. But many people, God has kept them alive for so long, hoping they will repent, hoping their life will change. Nothing. So many times we are only we are asking for long life for nothing. Just because we want to be alive. We just want to enjoy this world. That's not why God gives long life. He gives long life purposefully. What do we want to do? The reason why uh, uh, um, Joshua asked for more time is for the purpose of God. He said, God, this son, let it stay so that we can finish your battle. He didn't ask for time so that he can just enjoy life. And that miracle, because now I read geography, that miracle, my little geography tells me everything revolves around the sun. So let's assume, we are not even 100% sure, let's assume the sun doesn't move, everything moves around the sun. What God did that, it means he had to stop the entire universe. The earth has to stop, the planetary bodies have to stop, the moon has to stop, everything. Joshua didn't know what he was asking. Me as a geographer, I would find it difficult to ask God to do that because I know what is involved. But a man that every day they just see rising of the sun, setting up. So they just assume the sun comes, the sun goes. So God, just keep it a little way. It's not like this, but Lord, just keep it away. They don't know what they were asking. And God did that. But it was because men needed time to finish the purpose of God. Not that they needed time to just be alive. You see? One of the things we can do today is to say, Lord, give me life now. I want to enter into this truth. Because the Bible says that when Abraham was 99 years old, God said to him, walk before me and be thou perfect. At 99, God still called him. But you see, he still has to start from primary one. The issue of sin has to be dealt with. Even at 99, he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. At 99, he was not yet perfected. That is something we can cry to God and say, Lord, give me life to experience Jesus. Don't ask for long life just for the sake of, so that you can see your, your great, 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 great grandchildren. Ask it to do something meaningful for God. All other ones, they will not just become benefits. They will just be there. God will say, no, I need to keep this man. They say, sir, this man is 80. He say, no, 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 no. He is becoming more like Christ. I'm enjoying what I'm saying. Sir, he's now 90. No, can't you see that this man is changing? He's becoming like us. I want to see more of my man like this. Take him to 100. God is now 100, though. He said, What's your business? I still love this man. <laughs> you know, people still live comfortably to 100 in this same world, but not purposelessly. Let me just round up. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so, I, Jesus, have sent them into the world. Do we live consciously every day that I'm a messenger for Christ? I'm on mission for Christ. There is a purpose why I'm here, and it's because of Jesus. So that we are reporting to him regularly. We are checking with him and say, Master, am I building according to your pattern? Am I doing what you have sent me to do? It's a great thing to be sent in the capacity of Jesus. But it's also a great responsibility to be sent in that capacity. You know, my prayer, uh, there's nothing that is too late with God. There's nothing that is too late with God. My prayer is that whatever time God has allocated to every one of us, we will still fulfill his purpose for our lives. Because that ultimately is what is going to count. That is what is going to ask you. That is what is going to ask me. That is the reason for our living. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord.